going on, guys? Welcome to The Green Dream. My name is Luke Struken, your host today. I have a very special guest with me, one that I've been working to get on the show for you guys for a little while. He's a very busy guy. Chester John, welcome to the show. He's the owner, founder of Big Lakes Lawn Care up in Michigan. How are you doing? I'm doing really well, Luke. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, I appreciate you. I appreciate you making the time to jump on the show. We've been uh, we've been working on on getting you on here for a little while. You've been really busy and uh, getting our calendars to cross paths has been a little bit of work. But uh, I appreciate you sitting down and and sharing your knowledge and um, all the gold nuggets that I know that we're are going to come from this show. So, hey, so where there's a will, where there's a will, there's a way, my friend. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, Let's go back for the listeners uh, that don't know you. Let's can you take us back to the beginning and where Big Lakes Lawn Care came from? How long you've been in the industry? Kind of take me back to the beginning of the whole entrepreneurial process and 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 how you got into lawn care and uh, I don't know. Just take us back to the beginning. Sure. So my entrepreneurial journey really started in my mid twenties. I had a few businesses growing up that uh, didn't work out, false starts, whatever. And then after high school, I went to college for two days and I found out that wasn't really uh, my calling. So I ended up getting a job cutting grass. I worked at a lawn and landscape company here in Michigan. I spent about four years there and uh, upgraded. You know, at one time I had like three jobs at once. So I was always working, always hustling. And I ended up getting into an apprenticeship program to become an operating engineer. I was like 23 or 24. And prior to that, so if you go back a couple, like there was a gap in there where I actually put a down payment on buying a landscape company from a guy. We put like an earnest money deposit on this company, me and a partner. And that deal fell through and I lost my earnest money. Oh, wow. Uh, Yeah. So that's in the false starts category. But then... Um, so I got into the engineering program, became an operating engineer, and I always just had this um, this nagging thing that uh, I should go go into business for myself, especially after working in that industry. And so long story short, in like 2015, 2014, I bought a truck, I bought a mower, bought a trailer, um, hired a guy and uh, just, just got to work. Wow. Here we are today, right? Yeah, and <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. Overnight yeah. success. I skipped say. a few. I skipped a few things in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, before before we before we move on to, to to you know the next part, I wanna I wanna ask a question on on um this where you said you went to college for two days, so. Then you went, then, then you kind of went off and did, did some things, tested some things out and stuff, and then ended up going, I guess, back to school and apprenticeship was, is what, was that more schooling or was that more hands-on? What was the, what was the learning like with that? Yeah, it was mostly hands-on. It was a combination of like technical training and certifications, right? A few weeks of classwork per year, Um, but then it was a paid apprenticeship. So I was in the field learning, learning the field. Okay. so. So schooling wasn't the, wasn't the, the play for you. No, wasn't a play for me. Uh, traditional education, right. Which I think is, it's, it's a case by case basis. I can't say it's sure. either right or wrong. It's just, it's just different for everybody, you know, and I didn't have the attention span, I think, or the, uh, at that age, I just didn't have the the focus or the attention span to sit in class any longer. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, I, I wanted to touch on this because I get so many people now that I didn't go to school either. I, I did community college for a little bit and then ended up dropping out. And I, I get so many people that ask me, they're like, what do I do? Do I, should I start something? Should I go to school? And I, I, whenever I get a chance to talk to other entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs and successful people, I always ask them about the schooling situation because I think it's interesting. And I think people who are listening to this that that may be thinking, contemplating going to school or not, what they should do. I, I, I just always try to bring different perspectives on things because when you're in the mainstream 
you know, media and, and, and mainstream life of, of going to school and stuff like that, high school and stuff, you, you don't always get another option. It's just kind of like, you're going to go to college. At least that's what it was for me. And everybody kind of looked at you weird when, when you said, oh, I'm not going to do school. I'm going to do this other thing. So wonder what was just wondering what your take on that was and, and what you would tell somebody if they were thinking about doing school, doing not, should I start my own thing? Any, any advice to somebody that's trying to figure out what, what the next step is for them? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give one example that might help add some clarity. So when I was a crane operator, I got into the field, you know, it's a good job pension, good job by all measures of society and uh, made good money. But I would look around me at guys that had been in the field for 20 or 30 years, and I could essentially look ahead and see, well, that's what I will be like when I'm his age, if I follow this pathway. And then I met a mentor, who, someone who became a mentor to me later that um, was in his 40s. And I looked at his life and how he was. And I said, well, if I pursue a path that similar to his, then I might end up being similar to him one day. So who do I want to be when I'm older? What do you want to be when you grow up, right? Uh, I wanted to be that guy. So I started emulating the stuff he does, which didn't require college. Now, if you want to go into a technical field like law or accounting or medical, you've got to go, you have to have a formal education for that. But to get a formal education to, to fit in or to appease your family or appease your parents is dangerous. And um, mm. You know, the the path I took, I probably spent more, I've probably spent more on self-development and self-education than most people spent on their college degrees. So this isn't like like education and information and, and associations with people. I'll I'll spend a disproportionate amount of money on that because of the returns. But to go into getting a formal education when you don't really know where you're headed um, might not be the right move for everyone. Hmm. No, that's good. I, I, I tell people a similar situation that I don't have any problems with education. It's just the right education. So mm -hmm. go, go, go learn from the people that have been there, done that. If you're going to go start a business, not necessarily go to business school or something like that. So yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really good. It's really Absolutely. good. Absolutely. And I'm intrigued too, by people who have gone to business school. I always just, if I'm at a social event or whatever, and somebody has an MBA, like mm. I just pull them to the side and drill them. Cause I'm just so curious what yeah. the formalized version of my education would look like. Sure. I think it's an, I might get my MBA one day. I don't know, but uh, uh, there's a, there's a ton of information out there, a ton of places to get it. But if, if you're a learner, it, you, you need to be a learner bottom line. You need to be willing to learn new things and try stuff that you're not good at and absorb new information and apply it. And uh, you know, I guess where you get it from is sort of up to you. That's good. That's good. All right. So, so take, take us back. So 2016, you bought a truck, you bought some equipment, you're getting rolling. What does, what happens next? So it was a unique experience because I kept my day job. So I was working mm -hmm. full time and I hired my first employee the, the day I started the business basically. And that had some challenges we started to learn how to sell, learn how to market. He ended up actually uh, collecting. He went around to all my customers and started collecting a bunch of money from them. Um, so I had my first, you know, challenge with that. I had to let him go. But uh, it was really just marketing and selling work. And I would get home every night after work and I'd go hang door hangers out. We door, door hanger was like our number one strategy in the beginning. So what I actually did there, I, there were about, maybe, you know, 50 companies or so in my market that I could find as a competitor. There's a ton of them. So I, I said, I'm starting this business. I'm going to shop the competition. So I went through Google and Yellow Pages and all this stuff. And I just made this huge list of all my potential competitors in my market. And then I called them all. And when they would answer, I would just, sometimes I'd ask for a quote or I'd ask if they were hiring or I'd, I would just ask them as much as I could to to fish around and try to get a feel for what was going on out there. But what I found was that like half of them didn't even answer the telephone. And so I made a door hanger and said, we answer the phone on the front. And then I put my phone number on it. And then I hung out a 
crap ton of them. And then when people called, I would answer the phone and give them a price and sell the job. So that was our first real win was just like the, the door hanger thing and the tenacity of hanging those. I was hanging them out every night, weekends. My guys would hang them out. It, it was our key. It was the key in the beginning for us. Wow. Dude, that, uh, that that's such a gold nugget to, to, to call your competition and be like, let me gain as much competition knowledge from everybody else as, as I can right now. I mean, that's money. <laughs> yeah. It, I don't know how I came up with that. It's probably, even, I, I probably, you know, sounds even cooler now at the time. It was just like, <laughs> well, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to, again, with the emulation thing, I'm like, I'm going to call some of these massive companies and see what they do because it's probably working. But then I ended up finding a chink in the armor and it was that they weren't responsive. They didn't answer the mm. telephone. They didn't call you back or whatever. So that became our competitive edge in the beginning, which allowed us to pick up a lot of work. So it was door hangers and kind of like beating the pavement, doing a lot of like, you know, you were selling and all that kind of stuff in the beginning and all that kind of stuff. So, so what that got you, how, how long did that last? Uh, well, so let's say it was 2015. So, you know, I was just continuing. I would, I kept my day job until we were over a million in sales. So we would, oh, wow. would, every night, you know, I was doing the invoicing. I was, I was hanging out those door hangers and trying to keep on top of things. And, but at the same time, I was being forced to delegate and sort of build things the right way because I couldn't be present the majority of the time. And I mean, crane operator, you're not working like nine to five, right? This is like a, I was working 50, 60 hours a week uh, on construction sites. So I would just be working at night, working on the weekends. And then I hired an office person and delegated to her and got a bunch of processes for her and, and continued to build the company. We got the website going. That was obviously pivotal. You got to have good digital marketing presence and um, just kept fighting through the, the challenges of building the company. Right. And then I left my job in 20, 2019 is when I left that, the crane operating gig and came to the business full time. And that's so, probably when we slowed down our growth is once I showed up. <laughs> uh, so, so talk to me about that because that, th t talk to me about, I, I mean, this is a very interesting idea. You're actually the first person I've interviewed that has started their business, kept their day job, ran their business and their day job at the same time and had one I, you're the first person that I've, that I've heard of. I, I've heard of people. I haven't interviewed them. I've heard of people that said, okay, I'm going to do both. I'm going to do lawns on the weekend, my day job. And then when I have enough lawns transition to full-time mowing, mowing grass, you're the first person that I've heard of that has built a company up to a million dollars from scratch and kept their day job and have been able to put all that stuff together. So how did you find the time to build the processes and make sure that somebody was answering the phone properly and make sure that the lawns were getting cut properly. And I don't know all the services that, that you were providing then. I don't know if you were doing fertilization weed control, if you were just mowing grass, if you were doing the enhancements, if you're doing construction, I don't know, but how did you find enough time to make all that stuff happen? And then, and then how did you know what people to put in place and then manage all of that stuff while running a whole other job? Brute force you know, with some of it, definitely. But it was also like a masterclass in proper delegation and processes because I couldn't be there, right? And yeah. typically the biggest bottleneck in a business is because the owner is there all the time and you can't be the only fire extinguisher in the building, right? <laughs> so, it, you know, I needed to know well, if somebody doesn't show up, what do we do? I Because I'm not grabbing a truck and going out to fill in, right? Or all those things, I was just forced to sort of build a real business mm. um, with real layers of management and process that didn't require me all the time. And it's a that's the constant growth and struggle of a business owner is how to remove yourself out of the way and to continue to build a team. You know, like the CEO of a Fortune 500 company doesn't pick up the ice cream cake for the company party, you know, uh, so... Yeah. So it was a struggle. Uh, processes. I had somebody tell me early on the the little mantra of like, 
uh, sales over systems, right? Mm. So to, to over process your business in the early years, like anything sub 1 million, I think is a mistake. Generally speaking, you, you don't, you don't want to be sloppy, but you don't want to be anal retentive about your SOPs because everything's going to change. Now, if you're going to build a company, if you're going to say, hey, I'm going to get this to a half a million dollar a year company, that's my sweet spot. I'm going to be super profitable and I'm going to be involved and I'm going to keep it there. Then maybe you can optimize earlier. But sales over systems, it, it, the processes you build are going to break. And so to spend a disproportionate amount of your time on procedurizing stuff that's just going to change anyway is just you're losing steam. You're just slowing things down. So our, our processes were never very honed in those years. It was like, we got to sell, we got to grow, we got to take awesome care of our customers and we just got to get after it every day. And then over time, I started hiring people who had more of an engineering mind, more of a process type mm. mind. It was probably one of the reasons I didn't like my job as an operating engineer is because I don't want to follow a process, right? Typical entrepreneur stuff. You probably yep. don't want to either. You know? Yeah, yep. <laughs> uh, And so you got to hire people that can do that stuff for you eventually. But there's no sense in my mind of optimizing a small company. Mm. I mean, how pro how many processes do you need? You know, True. you're cutting 100 lawns a week. You got to you got to cut the grass, pay the people, and send the bills to your clients. Yeah. Are you still mixing station gas and oil for your string trimmer, leaf blower, or chainsaw? Eliminate the mess and the guesswork with True Fuel, the original pre-mixed two-cycle fuel. True Fuel is ethanol-free and precision-engineered for small engines, improving performance and extending the life of your outdoor power equipment. And True Fuel is available for both two- and four-cycle engines. Empower your equipment with True Fuel. Learn more at TrueFuel50.com. You're listening to Turf Up Radio, the only radio station of its kind dedicated to the green industry. Now you can even ask Alexa to tune you in when you're home. Are outdated spreadsheets and whiteboard scheduling costing you jobs? Or is a lack of consistency between crews causing your bids to differ from job to job? Or worse, delaying critical invoices and payments? Crew Control offers all-in-one business management solutions fit for every trade. From bidding and scheduling to invoicing and integrating payments, Crew Control provides real-time visibility into your crew's efficiency, whether you're in the field, in the office, or even on vacation. Manage your crews more effectively and improve business performance with Crew Control. Start your free trial today at crewcontrol.com. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world, here's to all the women in the green industry. Turfs Up Radio, your industry, your station. Yeah. So, so what was um, uh, what was the the biggest moving force for you on the delegation side of things when you're going through this? So, was there somebody that you were you were leaning on talking to you about? Yeah, you, look, you need to delegate that. You need to get delegate this, or was it literally just you know? going walking through the fire and coming out stronger on the other side figuring it out as you were going i what, what did that look like are you saying like how did i know what to delegate first yeah how how do you how do you how do you look at something and go okay i need to delegate this i need to delegate that i need to delegate this like how do you was it literally just i have no time in the day so hey susan come pick up this like what do you if somebody's like okay well that's an interesting idea i might i might try to follow your foot Foot, footprints in this then what would you what would you tell them looking back at um the way that you've built this is there was there strategic people you were hiring and putting in those positions was it someone you were just kind of pulling in off the streets and then saying hey we're gonna figure this out together and then okay she's saying or he's saying like oh i've got too much on my plate okay we need to pull somebody else in like what what did that what did that look like because uh, going growing from zero to a million isn't a small task. I mean, you you know, as, uh, like I do, that there's there's a, a small you, when you make it to a million dollars a year in landscaping, especially in lawn care, you're in the top percentage of lawn care companies. Like there's so many people that are doing quarter of a million, half a million dollars, maybe seven hundred fifty, but it's hard to get a lawn care company, especially up to the million dollar mark. And you did it while working a whole nother job. So, 
I'm just thinking like what what is is there any any insight that you can say this was kind of you know this strategic play of how we how we put this together or was it literally just we were just figuring it out every day Mm -hmm. no that's a great question it's a deep question so there's a few things that come to mind when you sort of talk about that one is like the mindset that you have to delegate because a lot of owners think like oh i could just do that better myself right or i could do that myself period or i don't want to pay someone well that's Mm. short-sighted thinking like you want to be the one doing the invoicing every week like you know again back to the public company ceo thing like does the ceo of true green like call mrs smith to let her know that the crew is on its way right they just don't so you have to have the mindset of of expansion like we're going to be big i'm going to have a bunch of people um you definitely another exercise that comes to mind when you're talking about this so right first is mindset you need to you need to know what you want and where you're going and you need to also be comfortable with some risk because sometimes mm. when you're growing you have to hire people before you can afford them so you need to understand your numbers to a degree and this is the beauty of a recurring revenue business like mowing or furred you need to say okay this person's going to cost me fifty thousand dollars a year and in order to do that i need to make i'm just throwing out numbers to illustrate a point but let's say i need to make an additional five hundred thousand dollars in revenue next year to make their position fit within my organization so you go i have you know i have X amount of revenue already sold because it's recurring. Here's our sales goal to afford this person. And sometimes you hire them before you can afford them and you grow into them. So there's some risk. You know, you got to be comfortable in taking risks when you're hiring people. And then I would also say that you need to know what your time is worth. So I was given the example a long time ago about $10 an hour work, $100 an hour work, and and $1,000 an hour work, right? Well, if I can if I could pay somebody $10 an hour to do this task in my organization, then I probably should. And I probably Mm. shouldn't be the one doing it because I'm effectively making $10 an hour. If I do that job, you want to be in the the high ROI on your time. Your time is irreplaceable. It's your most valuable resource. You want to get the most for it than you, that you can. So, and and what those numbers mean as you grow a company changes over time too. Right. So you need to always be, auditing what you do and how much is it worth to the organization and can you hire somebody to do it for you or do it better than you you know you want to be in those high numbers so what it does it sounds crazy a thousand dollars an hour what does that look like well it looks like uh devising an advertising campaign that's going to take that's going to double your company in two years or it's building your brand or it's inspiring your team or it's holding high level executives on your company accountable to their numbers and making sure they're clear on their responsibilities. You need to be working. You need to be thinking like a CEO. Mm. And, you know, that I guess maybe because of my mentorship and partially out of necessity, I was kind of thinking that way earlier on. I wasn't thinking like, hey, I got to go pump the gas in the mower to mow this lawn. I was thinking like, I need to have a backup plan for how I can, you know, when people don't show up, I need more. How do I build that? Dude, that's so oh, much. No, for sure. That I mean, that's 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 such a great point, and I think that's probably one of the big things that's led to your quick growth and the ability to get to the numbers that you were without even being in the day to day activity of the business. Which you brought up some good points that so many owners, especially ones that start from day one in their business and all that stuff, is is oh, no one can ever do this as good as me. Or and then fill in the blank for whatever that may be, and they may feel that across every activity. Oh, I can I can stripe a lawn the best. No one's gonna stripe a lawn as good as me, or no one's gonna answer the phone and sell as good as me, or fill in. You know what I mean? Fill in the blank. I've heard every everything single thing under the sun, and I think you've you've had a really unique opportunity and experience, and you didn't have a choice. Like the phone was gonna ring, you were gonna be operating in crane. Someone had to answer the phone, figure it out, you know, and just, and just going on down the line. I, you have a really, really unique story that's different than so many people. And, uh, and I hope people listen to this and, and actually think about 
what you're saying here because it's important to not get stuck in your ways and then wake up five years later and you're still, you're wondering why you're doing the same amount of money every year, making the same amount of money take home or tired of the same employee problems or whatever. And, uh, and it sounds like you were not really, you were, you were more of a, maybe running things a little bit more proactively than reactive, which is so many businesses today that, that they don't handle a problem until it's a problem. And, um, it sounds like you had a little bit more forward thinking and, and well, this might be coming down the line and we may need, need to figure this out. And I, I, I don't know, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's definitely what I've heard so far. Yeah, you're, you're pretty much spot on. And you hit on a couple keys there that I'll touch on. One, like you said, Hey, I'm going out in the truck every day. And in five years, I'm still at the same revenue mark or whatever. It's because you're doing 15, $20 an hour work. Mm-hmm. And no one at the company is doing the hundred dollar an hour work. Yep. And, and that's your responsibility to be in that world as quickly as you can. You know, also, like you said, you know, people, I can never find somebody that can do that better than me. You might be right, but oftentimes you're wrong. The best entrepreneurs find people that are better than them at every job in the company. And that takes trust. You need to trust. You need to take a chance on people. You need to have the worldview and the mindset that, People are generally good and they want to do a good job and they want to help others out and um, they can be trusted because if you treat people with mistrust, you're never going to grow a business as big as you probably want to. So I had to trust people early on and that resulted in some pain. I've been robbed. I've been stabbed in the back. I've been sued. I've been stood up like, you know, from challenges. I've had all the challenges with employees. But when one person doesn't work out, that doesn't mean you say, oh, I'm going to stay small and just give up on humanity. It means I got to try somebody new. It's I got to make a better hire. You got to try more people. And eventually, I mean, I found one of those people for me early on, which was probably a godsend. But geez, I found a lady who built our office. I hired her at 200K in revenue. And um, we went past 2 million with the same person in the same role in the company. And she was able to adapt and and build our office processes in that way. So there are people better than you at every job and you got to find them. And then I'll say this too, that for the folks listening that are in the five to 10 plus range, the problem, you probably learned how to do that. But then the next challenge, at least that I found is then you feel guilty Mm -hmm. that you're, that you're not rolling your sleeves up and getting dirty because you have less and less opportunities to do that. If you're doing $1,000 an hour work, you're probably like sitting quietly in your office with a pen and a notepad. And that's where the the misconception comes that like CEOs don't work or they don't do anything, right? And for a certain kind of person that makes you feel guilty because you want your team to know like, yeah, I'll go shovel snow for 24 hours. Like I've done that a bunch of times. And, and you start to feel guilty when you're truly operating in your role, or I did. and and it's good to know that your team, if you have a $5 million company and you go shovel snow for 24 hours, your team is looking at you sideways. Your leadership mm. team is thinking, man, he shouldn't be doing that. They know better. And I've had that experience firsthand. Like, like Chester, you need to stop going on sales calls. Chester, you need to stop looking at the little stuff. They're like, we need you up in the trees looking out, charting the course ahead. And so if you feel guilty and you're in that kind of revenue mark, then realize that your team expects that of you too. They want you to be the boss. They want you to be the CEO. They want you to be the big picture guy or gal. They don't want you to show up early and stay late every single day. Wow. That's good. That's, that's good. Because I, I felt that when, when we were hitting, we were, we were not hitting those kind of numbers, but we were hitting, a million dollars a year in, in, in sales. And, and I was, I, that was, that was a lot of what I was moving out of was the day to day. And and I had a different experience in the sense that I was the guy on the truck for the first 200 yards, helping the guys mow grass every day. And when I started shifting out of that and now, you know, especially in the later years of the company, I, I feel that because 
I, I hit a point where I wasn't doing those things anymore. I was in the office. I was doing, I, I was doing the office side of things. I was doing the sales all the time and the guys didn't see me in, in the field anymore. And I, I, and they did it better than me. It's not like they, when I would show up on the jobs, they would be like, Luke, what are you doing here? Go home. You're making this worse. But I felt bad. Like I was like, man, I want to show them that I can still shovel, you know, or I can still plant a plant. I can still mow a lawn. Like I can still get out there and mow 30 yards a day with them. And, and that was, that was one of those things I felt bad. Like it, and, but it was just a different type of work and it was a different type of role. And my guys were, would, would tell me when I'd show up, they'd be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. And I think it's a lot a of people, challenge. I think a lot of people that have had to evolve and move can, can move into different positions as their business has grown and, and evolved can, can relate with that. And, and it's a good perspective that, that, you don't need to feel bad. Like your role changes and your role needs to be your role. And and the things that have gotten you there, you know, aren't going to get you to the next position. So, you know, you can't be the one shoveling, shoveling snow or planting plants or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You can't maybe a couple days a year show up, have fun. So, you know, but uh, it's not, it's not your day to day and it's not your job. And frankly, you're doing your organization a disservice if you're doing that. Right. Yeah. It's like sending your general of your uh, army out in the first wave of charge. It's a good, that's a good point. Right. He's probably yeah. willing to, but if he does, then, you know, chaos will ensue once he's out. Creating art from darkness. For over 20 years, Cast Lighting has designed and manufactured the world's most durable, energy efficient, and technically advanced landscape lighting products available at astonishingly affordable prices. Cast offers an all encompassing line of products with everything you need to get the job done. Cast Landscape, their most durable product, is best in class, low voltage landscape lighting made of solid bronze with integrated and drop in LED technology. These fixtures are built to endure the most demanding environments. Source Lighting, a new division by Cast, is your source for professional grand landscape lighting lighting made of durable brass, offering both integrated and drop-in LED technology and backed by CAST, the world's most durable outdoor lighting. CAST Lighting gives you innovative, state-of-the-art, old-world craftsmanship with tomorrow's technology. Visit their website at cast-lighting.com today. That's cast-lighting.com. From the East Coast to the West Coast and around the world, no one rocks like Turfs Up Radio. Turfs Up Radio, your industry, your station. Cress is leading the transition from gas-powered lawn equipment for professional operations with the introduction of the industry's first truly game-changing innovation in battery-powered OPE. With the Cress 8-Minute Cyber System, professional landscapers can now replace their messy gas-powered equipment without sacrificing performance, power, or runtime. The 8-Minute Cyber System allows for Cress-made 60-volt batteries to fully charge in 8 minutes or less, just enough time for a while. Water break. Complemented by a full line of equipment benchmarked against gas-powered products, landscapers can finally take charge of their business and make the switch to battery. For more information, visit Cress.com. Visit Cress.com. All right, so so uh, you get you get further on down the line. Now you've now you've now you've come into the business full time. What do like what when you come when you quit your job and you're you're like all right I'm going in full time what what is the next step that then happens like uh, obviously you're at a pretty decent size revenue number you're you're bringing in some money and all that kind of stuff what is the first thing that you're like all right this is what I'm tackling now that I have a hundred percent of my time to 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 give to this thing what do you what what did you do like was it sales was it marketing. Was it making things more strategic and in, in the positioning and systems and operations? What did you do with your time when you went in all, all in? Awesome question. You, you hit some of them. So it was 2019. Um, that year, I think we did like, yeah, so we broke a million the year before. Um, so when I came into the business, I... I looked at the people 
I started coming in and really starting to like be more present and involved in coaching and leading the people, the, the high level folks at the organization. I came in, I, I came in in the finance seat. So I was really still paying the bills, managing the vendor relationships, working on that type of stuff, which is at least hundred dollar an hour work, like working on big negotiations and relationships. Um, that's a great question. I wish I could go back in time. I quit my job and the, so I was there for the, for 2019 that season. And, uh, I just probably worked on everything. I probably worked high level on every silo of the business and tried to improve it. The people, the marketing, the process, the, the brand. Um, we grew well that year, but gosh, I'd have to look back at my calendar and see what the heck I was doing. <laughs> it was, so it sounds like it was a little bit of potentially everything that, that, uh, it was. The, uh, that was going on. It was, there's probably, I mean, you, you, you know, there's so many moving parts at that revenue number that, and you have different people. How many employees were you at by that point? Probably 20, 15, okay. 20. And wh- what was your core? What was your core offering? Was it lawn care? We started in the okay. And the whole kit and caboodle fertilization, weed control, all that stuff, or was it just maintenance? We added for weed control in 2020. Okay. And then enhancements so and all that stuff. Like no, no construction, none of that stuff. Yeah, we we're doing some light enhancements by 2019. We were probably two thirds mowing and, you know, basic maintenance. And then probably the other third would have been mixed between enhancements and snow. Okay. You know? and, and back to the 2019 thing. So I think I would hope that if I look back now, most of the time I was trying to remove bottlenecks for my team and just contribute where I saw an opportunity for improvement. Hmm. Okay. That's good. That's good. So, so then what, what, what happens next? Like you start becoming more laser focused as time, time goes on in the business to where you are today. Like, what was it just, is it like a funnel where it starts really open and then just slowly becomes a very, very focused piece at the end? Or what, what is, what does that look like? Yeah, so your role always evolves as a leader, and it has to, in order for the company to get to the next level. If the if the if the company bottlenecks, it's because of the person at the top getting in the way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, 2020 was obviously the pandemic that was took some navigation. We were deemed non-essential in Michigan, unlike most areas. So we lost a couple cuts in April. It was crazy. Uh, I hired, that was the year we rolled out for weed control. And I hired a guy, I hired a gentleman to come in and just build that department, run it. And then it's just been an in, in, in evolution ever since, but you do pick up speed, you know? So I got a G, we hired a GM in 2021. And now really I'm in like the visionary role where he's the integrator of the company. He, he's the general manager. He runs everything. He has reports. And then I really communicate with him for the most part. Did, uh, for the GM, this was this was my biggest problem, and and the, ultimately the reason why I ended up selling my company and, and 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 moving on to the next thing was we'd gone through five potential G like general managers in six months, and it just was I I could not find somebody that meshed with our culture and that the guys would appreciate and respect and all that kind of stuff. Like, was it a, was it one person that you found, or did you have to go through several? What did you what did you look for when you were hiring for a, a GM? So I hired the guy in 2020, hoping that he would evolve into the GM. And he actually so he came in as like an operations manager that also was going to start our for we control department. Okay. And and I found out that he wasn't the right fit for that. So in 21, I hired a sales guy. And by the end of 2021, he had uh, inserted himself as the general manager of the company. Oh, wow. So, so he just kind of acquired yeah, so, the position. Yeah. He, I sort of, he like voted himself into the role in one of our quarterly <laughs> meetings. It was pretty brutal. <laughs> I got pushed out, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, he, a couple thoughts on that one Bravo for trying five times because you know, that's how business is like, my gosh, you think anything happens easy for anyone, then you're yeah. probably mistaken. So, you know, 
that's that's very believable. You had to go through five. But the other thing is like, this is why a bigger business is sometimes an easier business over time is because I had more people within the organization that I could look at as a possibility for that role. And I had, mm. you have like depth in your bench of people to, to promote and move up within the organization. Right. So the, the example in the field would be like, Hey, I have four, four employees. Well, one didn't show up. Now I'm at 75% of capacity today. Well, when you have 50 employees, you know, and five don't show up, you're like, okay, well, we got, you know, two more over here or whatever. And it's just easier. It just gets easier sure. as you get, through, yep. you know? Yep. So I, I wasn't even intending to fill the GM role. I wanted to keep running the company, but um, he, he clearly is better at it than I was and uh, wanted to do it. And here we are today and he's, he's involved. We have a profit sharing relationship with him and the company and uh, he's doing a phenomenal job. So, wow. That's good. That's a good point because, you know, that was one of the things that I had seen at a smaller scale when, when I was mowing the grass all the time and I didn't have a guy show up. Now it's just me or now it's just me and one other guy. That's brutal. I mean, the pain that comes with that is terrible. And as we continue to grow and when we got up to about 20 employees, someone didn't show up it wasn't that big of a deal. Like you would just move things around and the day would still function and everything would still get done. And it wasn't, it wasn't as catastrophic as it was when you were smaller. And I could see how that would just expand as you go up the, up the chain of, of growth where, you know, you have 50, 70, a hundred employees, a lot of stuff can happen employment wise, and you're still going to be able to function. Now it's going to be uncomfortable potentially a little bit, but everything still gets done. And it's not like the wheels completely fell off the bus. And now you're derailed for a day or a couple days or, or whatever, because so many people struggle with, um, with that aspect of, they think that, and, and to some extent, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but to some extent life does get, harder when you hire more people, there's more moving parts, there's more people to worry about, you're, you know, you're putting food on their table and all that kind of stuff. But at the other side of things, things get a lot easier because you've got more manpower to get stuff done and not everything is revolving around you. Um, But I do hear quite a bit when people are like, well, I just don't want to take on the headaches of having other people or having growing a big staff, you know, that's just so much work. And that's going to be a lot of problems. I can hardly get the amount of people in the, in the door that I've already have and all that stuff. And, and so people kind of, you know, they, they talk themselves out of it, but you're living proof that the more people that you bring on, the easier your, your life kind of becomes once you start building the right people and putting the right butts in the right seats. Yeah. It's uh, the, the thing is, is that you'll, you think, well, I have two people and it's this hard. Well, gosh, I can't possibly imagine having six people and have it be triple as complicated. And then, you know, God forbid I have 12 people and it's whatever, six times as many people as I do now. It's going to be, I have to work six times as hard, but that's not the case because you'll bring people on that have skill sets that can help you manage the whole machine and they will probably do a better job at it than you will. And and then it becomes your responsibility to curate those people and give them opportunities. And and the other thing is, is that people that are kick-ass probably won't come to your company if you don't, if you're not growing Mm. and you're not expanding and you're not making it a place where they can see ahead in the future that like, dude, I came in here as a salesman. Now I'm going to be a sales manager. And then I'm going to be a regional business development manager, right? Like a, an awesome salesperson wants to see those kinds of opportunities. It's true for everybody. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy that like we have to grow. We have to give more opportunities for people. Those people will then make my job easier. But then it's my responsibility to keep pushing the envelope and growing the company further. Like everybody's dreams have to fit inside. You know, if you say we're a, we did 500K last year and in 10 years, I hope we're doing a million. Well, you're probably not going to get very many motivated individuals who are going to jump on that bandwagon. 
That's a you great know, point. Back to the initial point is like it does get easier. You get people, you get people to solve the problems for you uh, that you're experiencing now, and the business becomes easier. I'm not saying it's you have to have a stomach for craziness because when you have more people, you do have. I mean, you just have more moving parts, and there is more stuff happening, but it's not genuinely harder. It's bit, mm. there's more there's more happening, but. You know, we bought four, I bought four brand new Dodge Rams. Um, when would that have been like July, like, like six months ago, I bought four brand new Dodge Rams, 3,500s. One's been totaled. The other three have all been damaged. Like, oh, geez. Hit, hit or run into something. Right. <laughs> oh, so God. like, you know, that sounds like, oh my gosh, I could never stand that. And it's like, well, that's a part of doing business. And now the managers who manage those employees are going to implement a training program to train people on driver safety. And then the GM is going to hold the manager accountable to administering the training. Right. And like, we're going to work through the problem and buy more Dodge Rams. So that probably wouldn't happen to you if you only had a four truck company. Yeah. Um, but it, so it's a different kind of, it's just different, but I, yeah. but if you work 40 hours and you have a million dollar company, well, you're not going to have to work 80 hours to have a $2 million company, right? You just have to be working on different stuff. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a great point. And, and your, your problems, your problems to some extent, just, just change a little bit. Like, you know, like what you think your problems are today are not your problems tomorrow. They're, they're a different set of problems, but it's just problem solving and, and, you know, figuring out the right, the right next moves. And you just got to be down to be able to, keep figuring out problems and just moving the, moving the ball down the road, you know, mm -hmm. but no, that's good stuff. All right. So, so let's talk about marketing and, and branding and, you know, kind of the biggest things that have moved the needle for you. So pounding the pavement, all that stuff was important. Then you brought on a website, I guess, at some point, when did, when did you, when did you decide that, you know, the web was where you needed to go were you running ads? Were you just focusing on local organic rankings? What did you, what did you do when you jumped into other marketing other than boots on the ground, door knocking and putting out door hangers and all that kind of stuff? I uh, built a website in the first year. I didn't build it. I paid to have a website built. I sort of knew being a millennial, I'm like, people are buying this stuff online. Um, yeah. But I also knew that it wasn't, I mean, like, I started reading a book on Google AdWords. It was like Google AdWords for dummies or something. And it was like a year old book. And then I like okay. got into my Google AdWords account and it was the whole interface had changed from when the, from when the <laughs> book was written. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, well, I, I'm one of these people that believes that, that sales is the life's blood of your company. And mm -hmm in our types of companies, marketing, and in the future world, marketing probably trumps sales. You know, mm -hmm. like something like 75 or 80% of people had made a buying decision before they even contacted your company. It's like they've decided based on your marketing and your brand, whether or not they even want to buy from you. So I knew, so I knew we had to be driving revenue into the machine. You got to feed the beast. So I very quickly decided I'm going to delegate this. I'm not the person to be the marketing expert in the company. I need to know enough to be dangerous. I need to know enough to manage my marketing firm and to know whether or not they're doing a good job, but I'm not going to do it. So I, you know, I paid to have a website built and then we went through a few over the years. We've had a handful of different digital marketing firms doing our stuff. And that was a learning curve for me because it, you probably know, Luke, it's kind of, sometimes it's kind of hard to tell what's really being done behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, for, for the entrepreneur. Sure. Like, hey, are you guys working yep. on my SEO? Like, oh yeah, we are. Well, how can, it, how it's can the wild, wild West and in, in the marketing, in the marketing space, it's the wild, wild West. It really is. There's, there's, you could say you're a marketer and you have no idea what you're, you know, and you acquire somebody's stuff and then you could just be like, uh, back here on the back end and the person that hired you has no idea what you're doing. Like that, that could be all you're doing. It's just like waving your hands around, like dancing in your room, like, Oh, I'm getting paid to do marketing, you know? And, and that's, that's so true. And, and, and it's hard to find the right agency and the right partner to, to, to become, 
you know, a strategic, it's a strategic partnership really is, is what ends up happening. What, what was, what were some of the things that you looked at when hiring an agency? So you just hired one right off the bat. You decided I'm not going to, I'm not going to take this on. I'm not going to try to learn this. I'm going to hire somebody. What did you look for when you were hiring for hiring an agency? So in the beginning, it was mostly referral based. Uh, But now, now I know like you need to agree with the firm upfront on deliverables. Like what can I expect to be to come from this relationship and when can I expect it in six months, in four months, whatever. How will we measure those deliverables? How do we know if you're doing your job or not? Um, Do you manage my, my pay-per-click? Do you manage my SEO? How do you, how do you bolster my SEO? Measurables. You need to have an agreement in place that says what's going to happen for what are you going to get for your money? Do you manage my, my um, social presence? If not, do you advise on it? Do you take a cut of every marketing dollar that I spend through paid, or do you put 100% of the dollars to the platform? Um, that's a great, um, I want people to f- hear that and read, like stop, pause and think about that because that's a great question that, that people will overlook in their contract. And the next thing you, you know, they didn't realize that they were taking 25% of your ad budget, but in the contract that you overlooked, the agency is taking 25% of your ad budget. So now you're only putting 75, 75% of that ad budget into ads 25% of that off the top just goes to the agency. That's a great point. Every That's additional point. dollar I spend, yeah. If I want to run more dollars behind the same ads and same ad set, it's gonna cost me it's gonna cost me 25%. So I would certainly be aware of that one. I've seen that. That's surprisingly common, or it was. It's still surprisingly um, common. It drives me nuts when when people will not. And, and a lot of times it's hard to even get agencies to disclose that they will tell you, yeah, we take a percentage of the ad spend, but a lot of times they won't even tell you how much. And a lot of times they won't even tell you if they really do. It's just one of those questions that you have to know to ask and be like, okay, so if I'm going to spend $3,000 a month in Facebook ads is, is, am, am I putting my credit card on file with Facebook and I'm going to see a charge on Facebook to my account? That's the way it should go. In my opinion. Mm-hmm. Is that you should take you should take your card and they should put your card on the Facebook ads and you see the Facebook ad charge on your account every single month. Like, all right, Facebook took out five hundred. Facebook took out five hundred. Facebook took out five hundred, and you know now that that five hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or three thousand dollars was spent because it's your card. But a lot of times, what agencies will do is they'll take your you'll, they'll take your whole ad spend and their management fee. And they'll run it on their, uh, they'll run a card on, uh, for that. And then they'll spend your money for you. But then you have no idea, you have no idea what's been spent. You're nailing it. You're nailing, You're nailing it. it. You're nailing That's it. Such an, elegant, such an elegant, elegant way to check it. Like, you know, I want to see, I want to see, I want to ask up front, I want to see transactions from Google and Facebook, and Facebook on, my on my credit card every month. Yep. Yeah. Great point. That's a perfect way to do it. That's, that's to me, that's the most transparent way to go. I mean, I just, I just, it's just like, this is my problem that I run into in the agency space all the time is that the lack of transparency puts the good people, puts everybody in the same box. Like the good agencies and the bad agencies are looked at in the same light because, because, you know, you're just one of them. And so we've been fighting so hard since I've gotten into this space. Like I've been fighting so hard to build a very transparent very like, you know what you're getting, here's what you're getting, here's the results that we're providing type of a situation. And that was one of the things that we, we started with was put a card on file, your card, you, here's our management fee. It's disclosed upfront. It's in the contract. Here's how much you're paying us to manage your stuff and to build your stuff and to market for you. And here's how much you're going to spend on ads. And, and forever, for eternity of this relationship, if you want to spend $5,000 a month on ads, $3,000 $3,000 a month on ads, 500 bucks a month on ads. That is ad money. And here's our management money because nine out of 10 agencies run it the way that the other way that we're talking. And it's just, it's, it's, it's just not a very, it's just not transparent. It's, it's not honest because you'll call and complain and then they'll go, okay, okay, okay. And then they'll spend more, more of your ad budget 
they'll take less money and they'll spend more of your ad budget. They'll get you happy again. They'll bring you a bunch more leads. And then slowly over time, they back it back off. And so now you're spending and, and they won't disclose that. Sometimes they could be keeping 50% of your ad budget. You don't know. Like it's just, it's just such a, it's just such a sad thing in our, in our space. Unfortunately, there's bad lawn care companies. There's bad agencies. You got to really do your homework and, and figure out who to work with. But Sorry, I just went on a little rant there, but <laughs> that's a, it's a touchy subject yeah, for me. Passionate about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's important. It's really important. Yeah. People are getting raked over the coals. You know, one more one more thing that came to mind about your question, who do you work with? You got to, same with the people you hire, it's going to be somebody you're going to be talking to every single day. Probably not your digital mm-hmm. marketing firm, but you want to have good a good rapport with them. You want to like them. Yeah. You want to respect yeah. them. You want to enjoy. You want to feel good talking to them. It's like that for me with employees and vendors. You just got to kind of hit it off. That's it's not your it's not the final decision making criteria. But if you don't hit it off with somebody, then you probably don't want to work with them. That's a great point. Yeah, it's a great point. And, it's, and especially you, you should be going into it thinking about the long term relationship because you don't want to be jumping around agencies every six months. You know, you're you're never really going to get stuff built out and really build the marketing engine if you're if you're constantly jumping ships and and all that stuff. So you really got to be thinking about it for the long haul is like, is this a company that we can get behind and we think they're going to get us to our goals and, and somebody that we can work with on a weekly basis or monthly basis or whatever that looks like. It's a great point. So what do you, what do you do? So now, so website came in the first year, stuff started rolling. You started spending some ad money, I guess. Did you transition from ads to organic was it, has it been ads this whole time? What is, what did, what did that look like? Did you, did you pivot at all? Do you, do you still do all of that stuff today? What does your marketing look like today? And, and, and have you made any changes from, from when you kind of got started in, in the digital space? It's changed. It's changed and evolved over the years. I can't remember exactly what we've done, but basically we've been running paid the whole time. We still do a bunch of paid ads. And we've also been working to develop our SEO for from the beginning, pretty much. So we've been really focused on driving reviews, driving positive reviews to our local pages, um, being involved in community pages, being on Facebook, all those types of activities. And then we're, we're digital is our biggest driver of business, period, still to this day. Um, as you know, it's really hard to kind of break out what comes from paid and what comes from SEO like yep. multi-channel attribution type stuff. But yeah. uh, we we spend a lot of money on the internet. It's the best thing. Yeah, it's good. Thing going. And, we spend, and we spend a lot of money on marketing too. I will say that. You talk to people who say like, my whole business is word of mouth. You know, well, how long did it take you? 25, we've been doing this for 25 years. You know, it's like, well, cool, great. That's impressive. But I don't want to wait 25 years to get that kind of a name out there. Yeah. You know, you spend the the returns you get on marketing dollars are in excess of the returns you get in any other investment vehicle I've ever seen. Real estate, stocks, crypto, I don't know, Bitcoin 2013, maybe, (laughs) you know, but you can predictably spend money on marketing and generate revenue. Um, And, and we spend a lot of money on marketing. Yeah, no, that's good. You know, as long as you can prove out, here's what a dollar gets me and here's where it goes and here's how I can fulfill the work, then, then pour fuel on the fire. I'm not suggesting you just go spend money when you can't fulfill, but once right. you got your operations down or they're close to down market that baby. Or, or the, one of the things that I would add to that though, is, is knowing, knowing one, the platforms and things to put the money into and, and, knowing how to do it because too many times I see people that are doing stuff and they'll run, like they'll get sold by a radio station to spend $3,000 a month in radio ads. And you know, there's a time and place for everything. But sometimes when, sometimes when I hear about what people are doing for marketing, I'm like, dude, you know that you just rolled your window down going 70 down the highway and just dump money out. Like, you know what I mean? Like you could, you could take that same hundred dollar bill and just go, and it's, uh, you know, it's all blowing behind you in the wind. You know what I mean? Because it's just like, that didn't really move the needle for you. Like, yeah, that's, that's marketing, but there was a lot of other channels that you could have gone down 
that would have actually moved the needle faster for you than Valpac or I'm the, I don't, don't want to call anybody out, but you know what I'm saying? Like, like just some of those different things. Like there's just, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I think it's important for people to sit down and listen to people that have been there, done that and listen to the avenues that they, they suggest and really think about where your customers are and go target them wherever that is. Maybe if your customers are on radio, then go target them on radio. I'm not saying there's any problem with that, but just know what channels your, your, your potential clients are buying in and go hit those first and rock those before you take on a a sub channel. Mm -hmm. And measure them. Measure your ROI in those dollars. Yep. Yep. That's good. Yeah. All right. Two more things I want to cover. Are me, Luke, are you telling me this was a bad decision? <laughs> oh, no, no, not at your stage right now. No, that's good. But <laughs> if you're going to go buy $5,000 worth of those and use that as your main marketing dollars when you're trying to gain new clients and go hand those uh, out, might be a problem, might be a problem, but I'm gonna buy. I'm gonna buy five thousand dollars in mouse pads. I'm gonna drop them out of a hot air balloon over my. Own oh, my boom! Market. Let's go. I know that's gonna work. <laughs> oh no, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Um, yeah. Okay, two more things I want to cover uh, that that we haven't covered and that I think are big deals in the industry. First thing is we've covered this a little bit, but hiring and recruiting. What do you do to keep your funnel filled and keep enough people in your, in your business. Obviously you have it, you, you've explained this well, there's, this doesn't come down to you. There's obviously different people that are handling a lot of this stuff, but what do you look at for hiring and recruiting and for people that are struggling right now to find good people to work in their business? What do you tell them as first things to go into and and look at when trying to grow their business? Now we're coming into the spring and people are thinking about, okay, the next year's coming around. What do I need to be thinking about right now to be prepped for the spring season in this next year? Is there anything that that comes to mind that you wanna that you wanna kind of talk about as far as hiring and recruiting goes um, that'll help people move the needle? Mm-hmm. Uh, a few things come to mind. The first thing I tell everyone when I have this conversation is mindset. If you have the mindset that nobody wants to work and there's no good people on my market and people are lazy, then that's exactly what you're going to attract to yourself. But if you have the mindset that, hey, I live in a county with 984,000 people and I'm looking for 10, what can we do, right? Or or I live in a town with 30,000 people and I need 10. That's not a very heavy lift, Right. Then the other thing I do, I train myself to do this for this mindset. I'm driving to work or I'm driving around in my market or I'm on the expressway. All the grass I pass is cut. All the trees I pass are trimmed, right? Like it's getting done. So there are enough people to do the work because all the grass in your market is getting cut, right? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Adopt the mindset that, we have an awesome company and it's an awesome opportunity for the right person. And we only need a few of them and we're going to bust our hump until we find them. And then we're going to take really good care of them. And I don't mean take, see these things take time as you grow, but I don't mean to sell a false dream. Like we take awesome care of our people. Like you're going to make $15 an hour. And like we have a barbecue once a month. Like I get it when we were small, that's kind of how it was. But if you say you're going to take good care of your people, I mean, like, look in the mirror and say, are we genuinely doing Mm -hmm. things that are on the best interest of our employees? Like, really? Are we figuring out any way we can to pay more? Are we figuring out any way we can to make this easier for them? So, you know, that's another mindset piece of it internally that you have to have. The next thing I would say, go into marketing, look at your P&L and say, how much did I spend on marketing last year? And then look and see how much did I spend on recruiting last year? You might not even have a line item on your P&L for recruiting because, right, because nobody else does. Well, we yeah. do. We have, and, and I challenge my team, like, let's right-size this because I don't think anybody's had any trouble selling work in the past number of years. If you had, if you had a marketing firm and you were kind of going, you can sell work, but you have problems filling the work. So how much, how much resources are you dedicating to solving the problem, right? 
track it. And just like you track your ROI on marketing dollars, track your ROI on recruitment dollars. We test mm. We test all different crap, right? We're on the radio, billboards. We're hanging stuff out, referral program, hanging signs in the pizza office with a QR code on it. We're we're on digital. We're on Facebook. We're we're at, we have postcards. We hand postcards to people. We're everywhere all the time with recruiting, and and then we're testing. Okay, where did our top? Who's our top five employees, and what zip code do they live? And where do they go? Where do they shop for their groceries? And what kind of music do they listen to? What radio station do they listen to? We've done this is a survey we did, right? What do you like to do on the weekend? What do you do with your family during family get togethers, right? So we can make our get togethers feel like a family get together, right? Then you take all those results from those people and you might find out, hey, 90% of our best employees live in the same zip code and they shop at uh, whatever Kroger. Well, how are we going to market for more employees then, right? So you need to be strategic about it. Another thing that I'll point out is that everybody in my company, in the office and the leadership team knows that employees are the number one, both the number one threat and the number one opportunity to our business. Mm. They all know it. And they know that all the time we're looking and, and we need to always be talking about it. So, you know, we're, you're at Home Depot on the weekend in the irrigation section, hand the guy a postcard. You get a referral bonus. You're you're at you're at the restaurant. This person gives you awesome service or whatever. Give them a card. Like my whole team knows that we are just constantly recruiting for people. So you enlist your team to help you. You allocate resources towards it. You make it a priority. And you're not afraid of it. And then one more point I'll say: we have a weekly meeting. We have a scorecard. We report on key metrics. Open positions is a key metric at our company. How many people do we need? We report on it all the time. And it's mostly zero, but there's wow. been times where it's, where it's eight or we're like going into snow season, we got to staff up in the winter. It's like 15, right? We need 15 people. Well, let's break it down and go get them. Um, so it's top of mind for us. It's top of mind and we allocate resources towards it. And I'm telling you what, man, the company that can crack this problem wins, right? Yeah. The company that yep. can crack this problem wins. And one, <laughs> I go on all day, one more mindset shift about this. Don't feel sorry for yourself because this is the problem that every company on planet Earth is basically facing. Therapists, law firms, hospitals can't get enough nurses. The school bus drivers in our town, they need more school bus drivers. Like, like be glad you're not trying to hire a neurosurgeon. Okay? <laughs> so um, true. So hard that is. I have so a buddy true. who had a, I have a buddy who had a, um, a tech company in technology. Um, and he's paying software developers 150 grand a year and he's doing good, really successful company. Right. And then Google moved in down the street and they pay software developers 200 grand a year. Yeah. So imagine having that problem. You need five guys to go cut grass for you. It's yeah, it's hard, but it's a different kind of hard. Sure. No, that's such a great point. That is, that is, uh, that's, that's, that's all money. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to cut that. We're going to cut that stuff up and I'll send it to you. You can use all of that stuff as, uh, as, as Facebook and Instagram and TikTok blurbs. You can, that, that's some money stuff right there. That's good. Um, we're, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to touch on one last thing here, which is a very important piece to the industry because there's not enough information about this and, and, or there's not enough, there's not enough people I think really talking about it. I think there's more people talking now than there were, but it goes back to where we talked, uh, about at the beginning of the show about education and that traditional education may not be it, but education as a whole is very important as you're continuously growing a company, as you're evolving, it's important to get the right information that one saves you time and money because why reinvent the wheel when you can go learn from somebody that's already been there, done that has been successful, has proven the pro has proven the process has already, you know, taken all of the issues and has made the million dollar mistake or whatever fill in the blank and can teach you how to do that where you don't have to, you don't have to take a million dollar loss to make that, you know, mistake again. You can go learn that information from somebody that's already been there, done that. Let's talk about coaching and, and some of that stuff. Cause I know you're involved in a coaching program um, and, and, and it's a, like a peer group and stuff like that. Talk to me about that so that if people are listening to this and they're like, man, 
dude, this guy is the man. How do I get more information from this guy? I want to learn from this guy. How do, how do people get in, in touch with you and talk to me about the importance of education and stuff you talked about at the beginning? You, ha- you had a mentor that's helped you through some of that stuff. Like, Talk to me about the importance of this and why people should be getting into a peer group with other successful owners. And, and, and I'll add one more thing just before you start. Make sure that you are hiring when you're looking at a peer group that you are actually talking to people that are success, successful like Chester because there are too many other kind of like phonies out there where, they're, where they maybe built something really quick and then sold it off and now they're a coach. And they haven't been through enough or they haven't been through all of the ups and the downs to really give you, I, I, they can only take you so far. And so um, talk to me about what you guys are offering and, 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 and what people should be thinking about. And, and just talk to me about the, the, the coaching idea and what the importance of that is and what people should be thinking about. Sure. So it's probably top five keys to my success. And I would say it's the top five priorities for anybody else in business or in life is to invest in yourself and invest in education and being surrounded by people who can help you get where you want to get. You know, what you'll find is that people are generally pretty open. Successful people are pretty willing to share how they did stuff. And uh, that information is gold. So, so leveling yourself up and getting around and getting involved in those groups and learn that you're not alone. I mean, entrepreneurship is a lonely place. You do stuff that most other people, if they haven't done it, they just can't understand. Nothing against them, but they just don't get what you go through. And so hanging out and talking with other people who do get it feels really good. And I, I was involved in a peer group from the beginning. I've got mentors I talk to all the time and I hang out with. And um, it's one conversation can save you millions, like you said. There's that the old, there's some quote like smart people learn from their mistakes and wise people learn from other people's mistakes. Yep. You know, that's what a peer group will get you. So recently I joined, uh, I'm a partner in a peer group called Green Industry Masterminds. We meet twice a month. We got some great business owners in there. We keep it pretty small. Um, Myself and uh, my partner, Carson, Carson has experience in um, Southern markets, you know, like in Arizona, he was, he was at a company that went from like 2 million to 10 million in like two or three years, really smart guy, really helpful guy. And, uh, we meet twice a month. We have private, private groups. We have an app. You can go on there and, um, get direct access to us. And we just kind of help you with your business and, and teach lessons along the way and show you how to grow and uh, get where you want to get. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it is awesome. We love doing it for me. I would do it for free. I just love doing it, but there's the volume of there. There's a couple things. One, like people, when people are paying for something, they're more likely to take it seriously and do it. You know, hundred yep. percent. I talk to a guy who does $50 million a year in lawns and gives me, he'll talk to me on the phone for hours. Um, and I'm like, dude, how can I ever repay you for the information you've given me? And he said, the only way you can repay me is actually go do what I tell you to do. Cause I've mm-hmm. given this advice to people before and they just don't implement it, you know? Yep. So, so there's a difference between free information and paid information, um, which is why we charge for it, you know? And because our time is valuable too, but I love it so much. Like I was saying, I would really just do it for free. It's awesome. And, and again, Luke, you made a phenomenal point. You got to be careful out there. Cause these things are a dime a dozen. Like here I am with my Lamborghini, like by, by my course, you know, you got to, yep check on people and see it's hard to see in this day and age like how people are really doing yeah financially and emotionally and spiritually and in their their health and their relationships like that's our peer group is like all of the above it's lawn and landscape owners but we want you to have like abundance in every area of your life and and if you're thinking about joining a peer group look at the lives of the people who are facilitating it and try to get an idea of if they're full of crap or not yeah, there, I, I see too many people now that that especially after COVID and and correct me if I'm wrong, but business in the land lawn and landscape industry, I think became a lot to some to selling work and getting work became a lot easier during COVID than it was prior to COVID. And so I've seen people that have 
gone out there and they're like, Oh, you know, I'm, car- I'm starting a coaching program and doing all this stuff. And I'm all, and I'm like, dude, you haven't seen the, you haven't seen the, the, the ebbs and flows of business yet. Like, how, how are you going to go? Like, what are you going to coach on? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's, we've been in a different world the last several years. We've been in a different world than, than pre COVID pre pandemic, all that kind of stuff. And we're, we're heading, I think personally, we're heading back into those pre pandemic business levels where it's going to be more competitive and, you know, there's not going to be as much work. That's just, you know, all right, sign on the dotted line. Here you go. First person to show up is going to get the job type situation. Cause there's just so much money floating around and there's not enough people to get the work done. Now there's always going to be that problem still going to be there to some extent, but people are going to have to be, you know, there you're going to, there's, there's just different things that are going to have to happen. I think in the next 12 to 24 months that a lot of people that started their business within COVID aren't going to have that haven't had to experience yet. And so talking to people and learning from people that have had a business prior to COVID and have had to go through the ebbs and flows and kind of the pre pandemic situations is important. I I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or if, or if, or any of that makes sense, but that's just what I've, what I've seen. Mm -hmm. I would agree with the, the business, you know, getting the business and, and the, during, during COVID, it seemed like uh, things were pretty abundant, but uh, you're right that you want to be, just be careful who you get your advice from. Cause now with the internet, it's like information, certain advice is just a dime a dozen. And there's a lot of people that are jumping into that space. It's like, well, the, some of the outlandish claims, it's like, if you make $10,000 a day on Amazon, drop shipping, then why are you selling your course for a thousand dollars? You know, like, yeah, so true. Just, yeah. It just is what it is. It's just how people are, but you know, choose wisely, but, but again, choose somebody, get into a peer group, get into a, get in a mentorship relationship or a coach relationship. I have a coach. Um, we spend a lot of money and now I even spend it on my team to have those relationships with consultants, coaches, and, and in peer groups. It is, it is, probably the investment with the best ROI. I know earlier I said it was marketing, but investing into yourself and joining a peer group is, is huge. Yeah. 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 Uh, I I don't know if it was Grant Cardone or whoever it was that was basically like, if before you start investing into other things, invest into yourself and your best return on investment first before anything is investing in yourself and growing yourself before you start taking on any other investment opportunities and all that other kind of stuff. So dude, I mean, I I'm a, I'm a big believer. We're in a, we're in a coaching program in the agency space that we spend a college tuition in every year to be a part of, but I'm being, I'm in the room with guys that are, that are killing it every, every day. And they don't care about talking about trade secrets or what they're doing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm a huge believer in get into a coaching program that's niche specific that you have other people in the room that have been there, done that in your exact, exact scenarios. We're not talking about generalist business stuff. Generalist business stuff is good. You can learn a lot from generalist business coaching programs, but you learn a whole nother level when you're in the, in the room with somebody that is been there, done that in your exact field and can give you kind of the next steps. And you know what to look out for next year, 24 months down the road, three or four years down the road. That stuff is huge and, and, you know, can save you a lot of money. Don't look at what the price tag is up front. If you're with the right people is all that I got to say. Amen to that. It'll pay for itself in spades. A hundred percent. So, all right, Chester. Well, man, dude, I appreciate you. How do people get connected with you um, that that want to learn more from you? Uh, how do they get connected with the peer group and all that kind of stuff? Like, where do where do people go to uh, to find out more information on you? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not too active on social right now. I'm on like a big social media diet. Um, you can go to you can email me. You, I'll give you my email address. It's Chester at BigLakesLawnCare.com. Chester at biglakeslawncare.com. If you just want to shoot me an email about anything, I'm slow to get to them, but I do. Uh, or you can go to greenindustrymasterminds.com. That's our, our uh, mastermind group. Throw your name, throw an application in there and we'll call you greenindustrymasterminds.com. 
All right. If you guys, uh, you guys should go check that out and, uh, go hit up Chester. So man, we appreciate you, uh, excited, excited for, uh, today's show and appreciate all the gold nuggets and stuff that you've dropped on, uh, on the show today. And I definitely want to have you, um, on the show in the future so we can talk more about knowing your numbers and all that other stuff. Because if you don't know your numbers, you don't, you can't do the profitability. You can't do all that other stuff too you can't build the business and, and, and some of that other stuff. So there's a lot of other stuff that I'd love to cover with you, but uh, we'll save that for a future show. Mm, I'd love to come back on anytime you want me, Luke. I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate you, Chester. Have a great, uh, have a great rest of your day.